Hey guys, Jeremy with Dragon's Breath Glassworks. Um, I am just about to start a piece for a bubble capture, and I thought I'd show you actually how that's going to work. So we've already gotten the glass out of the furnace and colored it cobalt blue with some fritz, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the technique itself. Uh, we're going to use a pineapple mold uh, to create dimples in the glass and then trap air bubbles inside uh, by uh, gathering over that. Now you can see little stuff, little bits of stuff on those uh, teeth in there, that's beeswax. If you pre-wax your mold before you use it, before it's hot, uh, it can help get the, um, the glass out of the mold afterwards. Those undercuts can make you get stuck if you're not careful or if you make a mistake. Even if you are careful, you can still get stuck. Um, and so waxing it can kind of help if you're on the cusp of not being able to get it out. Now I'm going to get this bubble really hot. I've already got my starter bubble in the glass. I've blown it almost all the way to the tip, and the position of the starter bubble is really important. If the tip of the glass is too thick, you won't really be able to manipulate it inside the mold, and it's going to get stuck in the teeth, and we don't want that. So having the right shape bubble is important. So I'm going to go over here to the mold. This is our diamond mold or pineapple mold here. Uh, I'm going to slide down inside, and once I make contact with the bottom, I blow. And when I see the bubble envelop the teeth, that's when I stop and then suck back in. A gentle puff out, and you can see we've got these dimples. It doesn't matter that it doesn't come up to here. We're not even going to use that part in the final piece anyway. These dimples are where the air bubbles are going to get trapped. So. I'm going to let this cool way down and then go back in the furnace and get more glass on top of this. If this bubble is too hot, it will not work at all. Uh, a few different things can go wrong. Either if this is too hot, it'll sort of collapse and you'll melt away your texture. Uh, if it's too hot, it'll twist and your bubbles will run, uh, which can be kind of a neat look if it's what you're going for, but it's difficult to control that. Um, so it's best to just let it be, let it get nice and cold. Uh, and that's relative, of course, you know, a thousand degrees or so. We want it to stop moving all the way at its core. I haven't made a lot of bubble capture pieces, but the ones I have made have turned out really nice. Um, I will show you at the end of the piece what one of those looks like. In fact, I'm going to grab one of those right now um, while you look at my beautiful furnace. All right, so we're back. I've got uh, this bubble capture technique, this bubble capture piece right here. Uh, this is a lighter shade, this is a copper blue. As you can see, those bubbles are nicely spread out. That's what we're going for on this one. So I'm gonna set that right there. I'm gonna go back into the furnace. Now this is really cold. I'm gonna gather up my next layer of glass. A nice slow gather to trap those air bubbles. If you gather too quickly, the bubbles will not form properly. It's one reason it's important to stay nice and cold on that gather. Now we've got those bubbles starting. They are not as clean as I would like, but I think we'll be just fine. I'm gonna use ordinary paper I've soaked in water. They started to twist a little bit, so I'm gonna twist them the other direction so that they go back to where they're supposed to be. All right. Now that we've got our bubbles established, I'm gonna go back in the furnace, warm this up, and then I can start inflating the glass. Cooling down the tip of the glass. And inflating the body. I'm going to add a hose to the pipe so that I can shape the glass. And use tools on it at the same time. I'm quite happy with how those bubbles turned out. They are moving 
ever so slightly to the right of the piece, uh, but I kind of like the way that twist looks. I can probably untwist it, I might try, but it's a relatively uniform twist, so I'm okay with it. I'm gonna use a wooden shaping block to control the size of this. I wanna keep it somewhat thick. And using my jacks, I'm going to squeeze down our jack line right above that first layer of bubbles. Very good. You can see those bubbles starting to form, like they've formed in there, they've been captured. This time when I Plate, I'm going to be stretching that neck out, tightening up the jack line, and then flattening the bottom of our jar. We flatten the bottom of the jar, put a little dimple in the bottom so that if the table you set this flat on isn't totally flat, it will still flat. Look at your dishware at home, you'll see usually a ring or a dimple in the bottom. And that is why. I think John might be nearby, and if he is, I'm going to ask him really nicely to bring a punty for this. If he can't, well then I'll just bring one for myself. John's right behind me apparently. So we're gonna remove this jar from the blowpipe so I can work on the other end. And for that, John's gonna make a punty. Now a punty is another metal rod that has glass on the end. He's gonna shape that into a dome about a 16th of an inch off the end of the pipe. And um, the shape here is pretty important, but the critical thing really is the temperature. Uh, not just of the punty, but of the piece as well. They need to be the right temperature to fuse together temporarily. Too hot and they permanently fuse, too cold, and when I remove the jar from the pipe, it'll fall off the punny at the same time. So do I need to cool that or is it good? Rely on the person who made the punny to know if it needs to be cooled or not. Because uh, sometimes when you look at the glass, especially when it's a little dark outside like it is today, the color can be deceptive. So I'm gonna use a couple drops of water to create some stress. A gentle tap will send a vibration through the pipe into the piece and cause it to break right at the jack line. Now this is a really clean break um, and I don't really need to trim this. So John's gonna hit that front edge uh, a little bit for me. I'll take it from him at the furnace because when I come out, he's gonna start up a lip wrap. We're gonna put a wrap of black glass right around the top edge of this. I think that'll look quite nice. I think it's clean enough that I don't have to trim it. I'll know for sure once I sit down, but I'll have time to make that decision while John is making the wrap for the lip. I'll go ahead and take that, John. Thank you. Now, I do frequently work alone in the shop. Uh, it's always nice to have an assistant, but you can make uh, lots of pieces by yourself. Look at someone like Bill Goodenrath who exclusively works alone and makes three-part Italian wine glasses uh, with what looks like no effort at all. So this is nice and hot. I'm going to come out. John is going to start up that wrap for the lip. Uh, black, please. I am going to trim this just a hair, not so much because I don't like the shape of the lip itself, but just to elongate the neck of the jar a little bit. I have my 
duckbill trim shears here. They make any trim job really easy. I resisted years uh, to get a pair, but, but I finally broke down and got a pair um, just a week or so ago, and boy, are they nice. I don't know what I was waiting for. So I'm gonna reheat this lip. John is heating up his bit of black glass for the lip wrap. And if we time this correctly, that will be ready right about the time that I sit down at the bench. When you're working in a team, having good timing is really important. I had just enough time to straighten that edge. And now, putting these on. I don't really care what tool I grab that lip wrap with because I don't cut them when they go on. I cast them away. I think you get a cleaner transition that way. Um, you burn that tail off. I find that, at least for me, when I cut the lip wrap when it's brought to me, uh, I can usually still see the tool mark from the cut line once the piece is cooled down the next day. Uh, you have to look for it. It's not really obvious, but you can usually find it. There are definitely people out there who can cut them and there's no evidence they were cut. I'm not one of those people. John's got a wooden paddle. He's going to use that to flatten the lip of our jar. I'll be using my blades on the inside and going down. He's going to be above them. On, please. Off. And now I'm just going to flare this open. That's it. You can glove up, John. John's going to put on a glove to protect his hand from the 1,000 degree jar I'm about to put in it. I am sitting on the other one. There you go, John. <laughs> I'm coming out. John's warming up the gloves so they don't stress the piece uh, with dampness or with uh, just cold fabric. There's our jar, folks. All right, John. I'm going to pop this off into your hand. And in the blue box, please. Let go. Not, I mean, not you. I'm sorry. I was talking to this. I should have said let go. There it goes. The punny was sort of holding on. John's going to put that in the box. Be careful what you say when you're working with someone. I was muttering to the piece and John thought I was asking him to let go and it could have just fallen on the floor. That was a, would have been completely on me. At the end, we put in that box to cool down safely overnight. When I'm all done working this evening, uh, we'll start that drop over a 14 hour period um, and we'll try to get a picture of it in the morning because uh, it'll go out in the shelf for sale on Saturday. Thank you folks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new. Have a great day.